Excellent. Let's do this, shall we? Okay, so um, last left off, we're talking about bone growth. Um, and also, um, <laughs> you can tell by the sound the timber of my voice that uh, I'm on the mend. Um, however, out of an abundance of caution, I'm going to keep my distance from you guys, um, even in lab. So um, I don't want to get too around you just to make sure that uh, everything is, is okay. And I got my mask with me as well. So uh, I'll go ahead and do that. I just don't want to do it while I'm talking because when I did this yesterday, I was having a hard time breathing with the mask on. So uh, it's just like a logical thing, like a psychological thing. I wasn't actually suffocating. It just feels like it <laughs> when you got a mask on your face and you're paid to talk. Um, and so let's take a look at um, some of the bone remodeling, right? So this is kind of like a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of review, right? Because we already talked a little bit about bone remodeling and actually a couple of places, haven't we? So we've actually introed it. We kind of touched on it a couple of times um, since then. And uh, this is kind of like within respect to the, the woven bone and we're kind of moving somewhere with this, uh, not just mentioning it again, right? So basically when you're talking about bone remodeling, Essentially, what you're talking about is a conversion of woven into lamellar bone, right? That's basically bone remodeling. And also moving from spongy bone to compact bone. So that's also bone remodeling. Of course, the idea of lamellar bone is your final product bone, right? This is your finished uh, bone. This is the one that you're going for. Whereas woven bone is sort of like your stopgap measure. So this is the one you just sort of put in place because it's cheap and dirty and easy to put in there. But the reason why we mentioned this is because you're always constantly cycling through bone, right? So you're always uh, changing your bone. Your bone is a dynamic system. It's not like you build your bones and you just walk away and you don't ever come back to them, right? I mean, the, your bones are constantly going through dynamic processes. They're constantly, your bony matrix is constantly being laid down and torn up and laid down and torn up and laid down and torn up. And a lot of that is going to be stimulated by a couple of things, right? So for instance, you have bone repair, which is going to trigger some of that dynamic process. Also calcium, if you need more calcium, you got to break down your bones to liberate some of that calcium into your bloodstream. This is a huge reservoir for calcium. And then of course, you know, stress, bone stress. So if you're putting a lot of load stress on a bone, then that bone will be getting signals to beef itself up, right? Because the idea is it has to be able to accommodate that loan. So what you're talking about here is the idea of bone remodeling, but not bone remodeling with, within the respect to laying down your skeleton for the first time, which is how we saw it for the, that first time we saw it, we talked about bone remodeling. But basically as a dyna dynamic ongoing process. So you're constantly laying down bone. You're constantly tearing it all up. And it's always going back and forth and back and back and forth. So let's take a look at the actual long bone structure. This is something that a lot of times students will be, um, they'll kind of have a question in their head a lot of times about this because they'll take a look at that medullary cavity. If they take a look at the inside of a long bone, they'll see it's like, well, wait a minute. This thing is like mostly hollow. Yeah, it's got bone marrow in there, but you're not going to stand on bone marrow, right? So a lot of times, a lot of people make the mistake or the misidentification that bone is solid. It's not, right? Which makes a lot of sense, because think about it. You only want as much bony material as you need to match your load. That's it. Anything extra is a waste of biological money, right? So the energy currency of your body is better spent somewhere else. You don't need a full solid bone, right? So that medullary cavity is something that can be used for something else. Like for instance, packing your bone marrow in there, and red white blood cells, much, much better use of that space than 
than filling it with compact bone. Not only that, but by hollowing it out, your bone is lighter. Think about this. If all of your bones were solid, compact bone, your body mass would be so dense that, I mean, we would be horrible. I mean, it would be like really, I mean, we would not be fast at all. I mean, like our like 40 you know, meter dash time because we just finished the combine not too long ago. I mean, it'd be like 10 minutes, right? I mean, instead of like four seconds. So that's a good thing, right? Because that basically means that the lighter we are, the more agile we are, the more fleet of foot we are, which is an advantage for us, especially either as a predator when you're chasing down prey or as a prey when you're trying to get away from predators. So lightness is a good thing. Um, but the compromise to that is if you're lighter, you're also usually a little less structurally sound, right? So that's kind of the giveaway on that one. To get lighter, you get less dense. But when you have like your solid ringed rod, this would basically be heavy. So if you have a solid rod, you get a heavy version, right? And that's unnecessary because just having that little ring of compact bone in our long bones is enough to handle the load that we put on that bone. So if we filled the entire medullary cavity up with compact bone, it would literally do nothing. It wouldn't give us anything. All we would have done is spend a lot more energetic capital on something that's completely a waste of, of space. So that's, that's very, very bad economics. Now, some rich people in this classroom, <laughs> <laughs> certainly not me uh, they may have a lot of discretionary income where they can do a lot of useless stupid stuff but like the body does not have that right there's no such thing as discretionary time or discretionary income it doesn't exist in biology what that means then is that if you see it it's there for a reason it's got a purpose and it's got a role and it's doing something because if it wasn't doing something, you would eliminate it and save the money and spend it somewhere else on something you did need. Okay. That's a dominant theme that you see in biology. So you wouldn't really gain anything. That's kind of like a bad deal. Not only that, but remember the name of the game is a dynamic system. So not only that, but the overall thickness of the bone itself can grow. Now, the way that it grows, and of course, uh, I'll look at as well, but the way that it can grow essentially is by adding, obviously, more material to it, right? So that's basically where you have your osteoblast, which is how you essentially grow the thickness of your bone. And of course, high school class would basically tear it all down and you replace it with new bone and things like that. So you're constantly going back and forth. So what you see on a normal day in the bone is a very, very busy epicenter of osteoclast tearing down matrix, osteoblasts and osteocytes laying down new matrix. So you're constantly recycling matrix. So you don't just make it and walk away. But this also gives you the ability to have a dynamic responsive system. Because even though right now, like, sitting down i'm not putting a lot of load on my bones right now but the second i stand up on my bones i start to put stress on my bones and my bones can read that stress and if i tend to put more load on my bones then this dynamic system can respond in kind it's kind of like oh i see you're putting more weight on yourself now so what we're going to do is we're going to respond by laying down more bony matrix so that we can like we can kind of upregulate our structure to manage the extra weight. And I'm kind of thinking of like a situation where like if we went to another planet, not one with a lower gravitational field, but one with a higher gravitational field, right? Because then all of a sudden our same mass, which would be the same on earth versus that planet, uh, we would have much more force on our bones at that point because the force of gravity is stronger on that particular planet. That would be creating a much heavier load signal to the bones and your bone cells would respond by adding more bony material in order to accommodate that extra load. So somebody, for instance, who's on another planet in a planet with a heavier gravitational field, we would expect to have much thicker and much, uh, much more bony material in their bones. Their bones would be denser. 
than somebody, say, for instance, who didn't have that. Now, the converse is also true. Yeah, Bex. It would, it would, right? And so like if we went to a planet with less gravity, then the lightening of the load would also send stress signals to our bones. And then we would basically remodel our bones to match the stress load. So if we're not putting as much weight on those bones, then our bones are gonna start breaking down the material and our bones are gonna be much thinner and they're not gonna be quite as dense because we don't need that density to hold our load at lighter gravity. And this is always, this is also one of the things that's kind of curious. This is also one of the dirty secrets of NASA, right? Is the reason why nobody's gone to Mars yet is because we're not quite sure how to pull that off. First of all, it's a long-term trip and NASA doesn't like to talk about the physiological effects of weightlessness. We're not quite sure that we're gonna be functional in weightlessness for that long a period of time because everything in our physiology has been calibrated for our gravitational field. Even our bones are calibrated for our gravitational field, our muscles, our tone for our gravitational field, our blood pressures, our tone for our gravitational field. Everything in our body is toned for our gravitational field. So we can survive a reversal of gravitational field for a short period of time, but it's gonna to start to significantly change our physiology. So uh, a Marsonaut, right, who goes to Mars could be a completely physiologically functionless individual on Earth by the time they get to Mars. This is also kind of an interesting sort of thing because then when you start to talk about things like alien abduction, or the alien visiting us, right, they always kind of have the same kind of picture, right? Big old head, like these thin spindly little arms. And here they are walking around on the earth. And when you take a look at this and you think, well, wait a minute, assuming that their physiology is more like ours because they're somewhat humanoid in nature, right? Than different. Last time I checked, if I got those spindly little bones, that's because I live on a planet with a low gravitational field. What happens when I go to a planet with a heavy gravitational field? The second I step out of the ship, I'm going to crumple like a tin can. So the fact that you see these spindly little armed aliens walking around is evidence that physiologically they come from a lower gravitational planet, but it also means that they shouldn't actually be walking around. So two questions, either they've got technology to combat that or you're basically full of horseshit, right? That's kind of the way I looked at it. It's like, really? So this is how they looked. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Because let me tell you what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a physiological system that can't exist on this planet. And you're saying it does. So there's some questions I've got there, right? So just remember that. Just because a lot of people say it doesn't necessarily make it true. There is such a thing. It is a psychological phenomenon, uh, mass hysteria, the lemming effect. If enough people say it, then uh, basically everybody believes believe it's true even if it's not there's actually we've had documentation of that so by the way ghostology is kind of in the same place essentially it's like oh yeah so now you guys are like great we're talking about ghosts now <laughs> what ghostology <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you've seen those ghost shows, right? So um, they have like an entire theology behind it. I mean, it's like when you listen to them talk, it's like, how the hell do you know anything about this? Last time I checked, the only people know anything about this are the dead people and you're not dead yet. So how is it that you're so convinced that there's all this whole mythology behind all this ghostology? And the other thing is like, I mean they're all supposed to be like just normal people that are just like still walking around. They just haven't gone to wherever they're supposed to go. But I'm like, if that's true, then why are we so damn scared of them? Last time I checked, I'm not afraid of you. Why would I be afraid of you if you were a ghost walking around? But I am right. That's the reason why those shows are popular. So there's a lot of sort of psycho kind of crap going on in those ghost shows. And that could actually be more of that than anything. 
Thank you, Bex. You dangled the red meat in front of the dog and I took it. Good. Yeah, no, it's weird. Right? And you know it's weird because ghosts don't really care if it's light or dark, right? Theoretically speaking, who cares? But what do they do when they go and investigate a house? They turn the lights out. Really? Why do you, why does a ghost care? I mean, it's like, they're going to be there one way or the other. The only thing that turning out the lights does is screw around with your head and your psychology so that you can make ever people be as crazy as you. Okay, there it is. Okay, let's keep going. Now, what about normal turnover? So we said it's dynamic and it makes a lot of sense, right? So we basically have dynamic bone repair. We have dynamic calcium regulation. We're going to get to calcium regulation here in just a little bit. But what about like, just like, like it's not associated with repair or something like that, right? I mean, is there, is there like a normal baseline of remodeling? That's kind of what I want to call this one is a baseline of remodeling. And there is actually. And it's driven around a unit called a basic multicellular unit. And what this is, is basically a team of cells. That's what this is. And uh, this team can, uh, composes of some osteoclasts and osteoblasts, like a rich game, right? That just sort of roams around the bone. And what they basically do for a living at a low level, right, is they remove the old bone and they replace it with new. Now, when you do bone repair, you're doing the same thing, right? Because you've got a bunch of bone debris in there that has to be removed and you have to lay down new bony matrix, right? So you're doing the same thing. The only real difference between these guys, the BMUs and bone repair is the rate. So there's like a basal level, like a low level rate of replacement. That's what this is. This is your replacement strategy. So you don't have the same skeleton that you were born with. You don't even have the same skeleton like in your 50s that you had in your 20s, right? So like depending on how many decades you've been on this earth, that's how many skeletons you've gone through. Why? Because it takes roughly about 10 years for one of these BMUs, for these BMUs to turn over your skeleton. So just like you're replacing your skin cells, you're also replacing your skeletal cells. Right. And this is kind of something that a lot of times students don't really have quite a handle on is because they take a look at their cells and they seem like they're there for a long time and they can be, but all cells have a shelf life. Right. And they don't last forever. So the cells that you had in your body when you were 20, you don't aren't the same cells as you have in your body when you're 50. Because you've gone through replacements since then. Okay? And you have to because all these cells have a shelf life. Your skeleton is warm, has a shelf life. So these BMUs will basically be kind of howling around the bone and they're looking for them chipping away at the matrix, breaking it down and replacing it, adding some new here and there. And they're just kind of patrolling around, roving around. They do this, one group will do this for about six months or so and you replace it with some fresh unit. But you're constantly doing this and overall it takes about 10 years to do a full replacement of your skeleton. Now, that's something that people don't really have a good handle on. Normally, people don't think of your skeleton as being replaceable, right? You think of like, oh, well, hey, the femur I broke when I was 10, it's the same one I've got when I was 50. It's like, no, not really. You've replaced it a couple of times since then, right? So why? Because the DMUs are constantly chipping away at it, laying it down, chipping away at it, laying it down. And it's just like a background thing. So we talk about the balance of osteoclast to osteoblast and laying it down, part of that balance is associated with this kind of background replacement remodeling. So I had a couple of hands going up. I know Denise, I've got one there. So in aging, what happens is this particular process gets less efficient. So for instance, normally speaking, in order to replace your skeleton every 10 years, your osteoblasts or your bone matrix laying down process have to outstrip your osteoclastic activities, right? Because otherwise what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to replace it, right? So as you get older, what's happening is the laydown processes get less efficient and the osteoclastic 
maintain. So what happens is you, instead of replacing it, you start to erode it because the osteoblasts are more aggressive than the osteoblasts. And when that happens, then you start to have a general, a very gentle, very slow progressive chiseling away of bony material over time, which is the reason why osteoporosis takes a while. It's a chronic sort of degenerative state that takes years in the developing. So once you actually have an abnormal densitometry scan, you've probably been at work on that for at least a decade or more. And that's where the aging comes in. It's just basically this balance between the osteoclast and the osteoblast starts to get a little out of balance as you get older. Tear down, overheats the buildup. Correct. And it's, it's very slight and it starts off very slow. And that's the reason why osteoporosis tends to sort of accumulate as you get older. It doesn't happen like right away, right? It happens progressively over time and it could take quite some time before it really starts to kick in. Yes, plus that micro fractures and your discs start to harden and they collapse down. So you lose about a quarter of an inch or so. So yeah, that's a good question, right? So like if you have like a, a bone break somewhere, why is it recapitulating that? Um, that's a good question. Probably because all it does is basically just replace what's already there. So it's not like it fixes it. It's not like it relays it down. It just literally does a one-to-one -one replacement. So if you've got like a little bit of a bony callus buildup where a, a break was, then it's not gonna smooth that out necessarily. It's literally just gonna replace that bony callus. So it's gonna look the same. So, yeah, it's just a new updated material. So it's not actually fixing it or making it better, it's just replacing it. So, so this kind of goes into like obviously the osteons, right? So basically the osteons are in control or in contact with the blood supply. Um, and so this is where the osteoclasts get to it, right? So the osteoclasts sort of sneak in there, they start to tear down stuff. And then the osteoblasts will come in and they'll lay down that, that bone and they'll replace an osteon. Um, so that's basically what's happening is you got this back and forth the tear down processes. So even as you, as you sit, you're going through a process of tear down and rebuild. So you're slowly over time rebuilding your skeleton. And that's helpful, right? Because what that means is you got like this baseline activity between your tear down and your build up. So that if you do break a bone and you need to upregulate that, you're not starting off cold, right? You've already got some background activity. All you need to do is upregulate it to clean this one area up and kind of fix it. So you're just an extension of what you're already doing. You're just sort of upregulating it a little bit. That idea of having like background activity so that you can't, you don't have to do a cold start. You can just basically upregulate or downregulate is, is, is what we refer to as tonality. Right, so when you're toning a muscle, what you're doing is you're training your muscle to be active at, at low levels, but consistently. So you're kind of creating a sense of low level activity. So you're always ready, on the ready. And physiologically, you have the same thing. This idea of tonality, where your physiological systems will always have like a base rate, where they're kind of ready to go. And all you need to do is either increase it or decrease it. And, but you have a starting point to work with. You don't have to just start off with nothing. Right? That's a tonality, that, that's what that means. So um, we also talked about increased stress, right? So basically if you put more stress on your bone, then it can start to stimulate more the modeling. It can add bone to it. Um, and it can also reorganize and align your trabeculum to um, run along the stress lines, right? So that's the key. That's not the thing, but it's like a colonnade. If I have a two different pieces of like metal or stone or whatever, and I put stress directly down like this, which one do you think is going to break first? Yeah, right? Because your stress lines are not aligned with the strength of your system, right? This is the reason why columns and colonnades are such a very widely used. Um, system in antiquity 
in ancient architectures because they have the capacity because the stress line is going straight down the middle of the column to withstand a lot of stress. There's a reason why you have these big massive buildings, these big massive stones resting on top of these columns is because of that. Your body basically does the same thing. So you just basically align these trabecula so they line up with the stress lines and it's like creating a column. Okay. And it allows you to be able to absorb more of that stress. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this. So when you stress out like a compression force, so here's basically you're putting kind of a force of body weight, for instance, of a femur. What's going to happen is you're going to put different types of forces in different areas. So the biggest force is going to be actually on the medial side. And there's a lighter force on the outer side. How do you know that? Because of the way it breaks. Right. So if you break it, it breaks outward. Right. It snaps outward, not inward. That means there was a greater stress force on the inner side or the medial side of the, of the femur, not on the outer side. Well, it's not a disparity in forces, right? A really strong medial force versus a, a, a lateral force. Then how do you respond to that as a bone? Looks very simple. You basically add new bone to that medial side. So you thicken it up on the medial side to withstand the extra load. And since you don't have the same load issues on the lateral side, you can remove some of that bone and actually reuse it somewhere else, right? You don't necessarily have to use it on the medial side, but you can reuse it somewhere else. So notice what I did here was I remodeled my femur and then what's the end result? Balanced forces. So now we have a situation where it's much, much more healthy for the femur because now you got a nice equal balance of distribution of forces between the medial side and the lateral side, right? And that's, and that's using basic physics, by the way, right? So if you have a force, if you're able to disperse the force, then there is less force per dispersal than there is the force total. What does that mean? That means if I put a certain amount of force on my thumb, all that force is coming through my thumb. That's going to be a heavy force that's going to be felt by this table. If it's weak, I could break it, right? But if I take that same force and I disperse it through the entirety of my palm of my hand, then there's going to be less force altogether because it's spread out, right? So I have to divvy it up across a greater space. So there's going to be less likelihood that I'm going to break the tabletop, right? That's the same thing that's happening here. What you're doing is you're dispersing the force in order to reduce the uh, the effect of the force in any one given area. And you can do that if by just rebalancing these stress signals. And that's kind of what's happening in this particular image. Now you're doing this because you're constantly chipping away at your bones, literally, right? And rebuilding your bones constantly. So when you, you know, when you get a, a bit of an unbalancing force, it's just like, it just basically works on it naturally. It's like, okay, we've got an unbalancing force. So let's just go ahead and pile up a little bit more here. And then, chip away a little bit of something here and then we'll kind of rebalance everything. So that's something that's constantly going on, like um, ad nauseous pretty much all the time. So let's go ahead and break your bone. Let's snap it in half. No, let's not do that. Um, right, but let's go ahead and see what happens with a break. Now, remember when you're talking about a fracture, you're basically talking about the same basic process. But it's just upregulating, right? It's a couple of uh, basic things. So generally speaking, depending on how you break it will have obviously a significant impact on how it heals. Okay. Um, and so there's a lot to that. Well, a lot of times when, the, when you have to kind of take a look at a break, that's to take a look at the break type and the way it broke and the nature of shattering or splintering. And they have to see what kind of damage is done because it kind of affects how they're going to treat that break. Um, and so, the mechanism of fracture is an important thing. So you have to know how it broke. Um, like a twisting break is different than a, just a clean, like, like a snapping a twig kind of a break, right? It's a different, a different set of damage, but they're all traumatic. Remember your bone is vascular, right? There's a lot of vasculature going on in there. There's a lot of muscles attached to your bone. 
there's a lot of ligaments attached to it. So there's a lot of stuff on your bones. When you break a bone, you're damaging all these tissues. So everything about a bone is traumatic. Right? A bone break is traumatic. Um, and so ultimately then what you want to do is you want to take a look at not just the mechanism, but you want to take a look at how the soft tissue is damaged in nature, right? This kind of gets to your closed versus open fracture um, idea. And I know you mentioned that a couple of times this semester. Um, displacement versus non-displacement. So basically like is the bone essentially in the same spot roughly or has it been displaced or what's the nature of it? The pattern, and that's mostly what I was talking about, like um, in terms of the way it looks, right? This is your pattern, if it's a spiral or a linear or stress or compression, right? So these are all different types and they have different ways of going about them um, in terms that an orthopedist would, would work on. If there's fragments, right? We want to know that. Uh, we want to know how many. And we want to know where they are, right? So um, this kind of gets us to the idea of incomplete, complete, or com uh, coming, uh, commuted. Um, I was going to say something I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, right? So it's, this is kind of like where we're characterizing the nature of the break itself. Uh, and then, of course, age specific. And I love this one green stick. Um, a green stick is basically when you're talking about green stick, they're talking about like uh, a kid with uh, like a, an active growing plate, right? Because that's a problem. So, if you break your epiphyseal plate, that is your growing plate, then um, that's, that's an issue because that could compromise your bone growth going forward if you damage your epiphyseal growth plate and that's always a thing associated with that right and of course if it's an epiphyseal line it's problematic anytime you're breaking the epiphysis or anywhere in the epiphysis that's a problem because those epiphyses typically are fairly they're a little bit harder to break they're a little more secluded they're a little more protected depending on where you are in the body normally it's easier to break the diaphysis to break the epiphysis means you must have taken a pretty good blow at about that region. Um, and I mean, it was a pretty violent blow and a pretty targeted blow. Um, but just kind of like, so let's go ahead and take a look at it. So here we have a, a radius and ulna kind of a situation. So these are the diff different types. So you have like a linear, which is just basically running down the length of the bone itself. A complete is where it kind of crosses cuts and cross section um, and that's kind of what we usually think about when we think about a broken bone and incomplete is when it kind of fractures kind of when you're trying to break a twig but it doesn't quite break apart it just sort of frays a little bit obviously a complete is going to be easier to heal because it's a kind of a clean cut it's an easy matchup Right, whereas an incomplete, it's a little on the messy side, right? So there's a little bit more variation going on there. Um, if it's shattered, or if it's just a transverse, an easy one, or if it's impacted, right? So this is basically when you have an impact. Uh, that's like a compression situation where you have an impact. A spiral is a twist. So this will happen a lot in your lower leg bone. Twisting and pivoting, your bones will actually twist and pivot in it. It'll kind of like shatter them. Oftentimes, this is accompanied with just a debris field of fragments all over the place, right? Because you can imagine just twisting a bone that's just going to shatter and it's going to have all these little debris shards kind of all over the place. Pretty ugly one. Uh, an oblique is one that has an angle on it. So, I mean, if you get into orthopedics, you get into a lot more depth in all the different, like you're in the colleagues, fractures and all the different types of fractures that are named after people and things like that. But generally speaking, it's our orthopedists that are doing a lot of that. So let's take a look at the fix it, shall we? So there's some distinctive phases associated with um, bone repair. It's a vascular system. So there's all those blood vessels in the bone and around the bone. So when you break it, what happens is basically blood is spewing everywhere, right? That's basically, that's the reason why when you break a bone, 
there's a lot of bruising around the bone, right? That's because a lot of that blood, those blood vessels are spewing all over the place. And that blood is pooling in the tissue. That creates what's called a hematoma. So this is your pooled blood. that is coagulating. So that's the first thing that does, that happens, is you kind of form a clot, essentially, which is coagulated blood. Now, obviously, this is not your final solution, is it? This is not your go-to plan. This is simply just levels of crisis management. Having a blood clot is better than having nothing at all, right? Because at, at stage one, what you're interested in, the reason why you're doing blood clot is you want to basically stop the bleeding. That's what you want to do. That's the most important thing. Forget about the bone, right? Bone Forget about that, right? You're not going to save the bone right now. What's done is done. Right now, the priority is stop the bleeding because if you don't stop the bleeding, guess what's going to happen? You're going to bleed out, right? And it doesn't take long for you to bleed out. Um, a lot of people think it was like, oh, if I nick a coronary or a nick a femoral, it's going to take me a couple hours to bleed out. I know it's not. Um, if you get a true like spot on nick of any of those big vessels, it's going to it's going to be frighteningly fast. Um, so the reason why we do nick one of those, we start running into pretty heavy duty crisis medicine like the tourniquet idea, right? The idea like, yeah, you're going to you could lose your leg is cut off from blood, but at least you might save your life. Right? I mean, that's kind of the kind of decision you're making at that point. Would you rather live and not have a leg? Or would you rather just keep the leg and be a pretty corpse? Because that's where we're going here, right? So it can be <clears throat> All So the next step then, and the, the next uh, series of steps is actually like a progression of like increasing your structural wherewithal in your plug, right? So the, the, the least structurally significant of all these is that little blood clot, right? That's not gonna help anything. You're not gonna walk on a blood clot, right? But you will stop the bleeding. So what do you do next? Well, you wanna start removing the blood clot and replacing it with for increasingly more structurally sound tissue. The first stop is callus formation. And so typically there's two different types of calluses. And for the most part, this is uh, more like connective tissue. So a lot of connective tissue in the callus itself. And so what's gonna happen is you're gonna form two different calluses. Uh, you're gonna internal and an external callus, a callus, callus, we're talking about kidneys now. Um, and so what happens then is as you have essentially sort of cut off everything, still have to basically revascularize it, right? So it's not an option to have it cut off from civilization. Why? Because the cells that are gonna help you rebuild the tissue are gonna be coming from your blood vessels. So that's the way they get around the body is through the blood vessels. So if you want to have cells to rebuild your tissue, you have to figure out how to get your delivery lines back in there. That's the reason why you see blood vessels growing into the hematoma. This is so that you can deliver the cells to the site. What cells? And what do they do? Well, one cell finds the macrophages, right? Macrophages, a phagocytic thing. So these guys are going to come in there. They're going to clean up the debris. There's a lot of debris here, by the way, right? This is just uh, the complete train wreck of debris. So the macrophages are going to come in there. They're going to gobble up all the debris, and they're going to get rid of it. What else is coming? Your osteoclasts. So the osteoclasts now are basically going to come in and they're going to break down the dead tissue. What dead tissue? Dead bony tissue. So remember, when the bone gets divorced of its normal blood supply, like the canal, the central canal, things like that, that those cells are going to die. That's what's happening during the hematoma stage is that those cells are dying. Those osteocytes are dying. Okay, So that all becomes dead tissue. What's left behind is that calcified bony matrix, right? That hard bony matrix, that's left behind. 
but it's like a ghost town now, right? There's no living cells in it anymore because that bone has died. So who comes in there and decomposes the bony matrix that's left there? The osteoclast. So they come in here and they break down that dead bone tissue that doesn't have any more osteocytes in it. Who else is coming to town? Fibroblasts. The fibroblasts are everywhere in tissue repair. What do they do? They basically lay down collagen and granulation tissue, right? This is all connective tissue. So fibroblasts are basically laying down connective tissue. Now let's take a look at this. You have two cells that are cleanup crews, right? So you have macrophages cleaning up debris, what the macrophages don't clean up, which is mostly like cellular debris and other sorts of things, blood cells, things of that nature, right? That's what the macrophages are cleaning up. Osteoclasts are specifically cleaning up bony tissue. And then the fibroblasts are laying down new collagen. So you're kind of laying down a matrix of collagen and granulation tissue to give yourself kind of like a background tapestry of structure so that you can start to overlay the, 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 the other structures that are gonna be more structurally sound on top of that. So who else is coming to town in the internal? Well, chondroblast. So if you're a chondroblast, what are you bringing with you? What do you lay down? Yeah, cartilage. Is cartilage your end plan? No, oh, but it's better than connective tissue, right? It's better than hematoma, certainly, right? But it's not the end of it all. So these chondroblasts, basically, where are they coming from? They're probably coming from our progenitor cells. Remember, we had those progenitor cells hanging out in the periosteum, from the endosteum. Now these guys will invade and they'll start laying down cartilage. <clears throat> so now you've increased your structural ability. So you're doing good. You've replaced your hematoma, which doesn't have much structure to it, with cartilage, you're doing a lot more to it. And then finally, you bring in your osteoblast. Now you're getting serious about it. Now you're getting your newborn formation. Does this sound familiar? It almost sounds like a recapitulation of endochondral ossification, doesn't it? You basically have all these cells that are coming in and you start off with a cartilaginous background, right? So cartilaginous foundation but laid down by the chondroblast and then the osteoblasts come in and replace it with bone, right? So basically bone repair is kind of like a recapitulation of endochondral ossification with a couple of cleanup crews that come in. So you, have, you add into that the macrophage and the osteoclast to clean the mess up first before you lay down this background. This is happening on the internal side of it. On the external, where your periosteum is, you have your progenitor cells, which are turning into blast cells, both osteo and chondroblast cells. And they're making a, a bone cartilage fusion type of a, of a collar around the outside. So it's kind of like a little bit cartilage, a little bit of bone, because you got both chondroblasts and osteoblasts at work there. So you have both things. You have the inside of the bony collar, and you have the outside of the bony collar working at the same time. So you're working on the inside of the medullary cavity and the outside of the medullary cavity. Then, once you have your two calluses set down, then you get to ossification. This is where all of the calluses all is replaced by woven bone. That is to say, the cartilaginous callus is replaced by woven bone, which typically is spongy because that's the easiest to make. Not going to compact bone, it's all spongy because this is the easiest bone to make. And then after that, you get to the remodeling phase where you replace the spongy with your compact. And this is kind of where you get your final long bone structure back. Now, depending on the bone, the uh, these different these phases can last for varying amounts of time.
It's kind of what it looks like. Here's a nice little break there. That's an unfortunate one. Here there's my girly turn. Especially this one looks like a little kid. It's like a little chubby baby. But those are terrible, right? Because it kind of immobilizes your entire pectoral girdle pretty much. Does it? Yeah, it's an arm. But here's the radius and the ulna right there. So this is the radius and the ulna right there. So that would be the humerus. Did I not say humerus? What did I say? Did I say humerus? Yeah, that's the radius and the ulna. So you can see here how this, this is kind of, this is pictures of how it works. So here you can see the hematoma, you're basically filling it all with this giant plug, right? This blood clotted plug. Now notice what's also happened is you've also ripped the periosteum, but that's not a bad thing, right? Because you still have the cellular layer, the periosteum, so which is where all your blast cells are coming from. So you, you have a, a little garrison of troops that are ready to roll. And then as you get to the callus formation, you have the internal callus and the external callus. So the internal callus begins by laying down on the internal side. Um, and so it starts to lay down cartilage. So you can kind of see you replace that entire hematoma plug with this kind of cartilage. So all those chondroblasts are busy filling this whole area with cartilage. So you got much, much better, but just this, something like this, if it's a weight bearing, like a femur or something like that, you're not gonna be able to put weight on this thing, um, right? Cause it's called cartilaginous now, but you can see here, this little creep of bone that's coming in. That's the woven bone. So those osteoblasts are slowly starting to replace that cartilage. And they're starting to basically add woven bone in there. And so here you can see the calcification where you can see it's basically replaced all the cartilage with woven bone. And you can see all these little trabecular nooks and crannies in here, heavily invaded by the vasculature. And so now you've got your spongy bone plug. So that's better, right? And then you go to remodeling where you kind of smooth it all out. You replace your compact bone and you clear out your medullary cavity and now your bone is back to where it used to be okay so that could the bone remodeling part could actually depending on the bone it could actually take quite some time right so if you break a bone it could take uh you know months before it finally gets to its final remodeling so let's take a look at some physiology shall we some physiology of bone so in this particular case, we have calcium, right? That's the big one. So calcium homeostasis, if you take a look at calcium homeostasis, you have a natural peak and trough and peak and trough, especially calcium. So it's a normal ebb and flow, like a tide coming in and going out and going in and going out. And it all oscillates around a homeostatic normal, which is, here. Now, here's the thing with homeostatic mechanisms is there has to be some sort of regulatory mechanism that basically will take a peak and turn it down, deflect it, right? And there also has to be some sort of a homeostatic mechanism that will take the trough and inflect it and turn it back up. So from a physiological standpoint, it's like physiological table tennis, right? If I hit it to you, you have to hit it back to me and I have to hit it back to you and you have to hit it back to me. Between the two of us, we represent normal, the homeostatic norm. That's kind of the way it is with blood calcium. Now, of course, since there's a lot of calcium in bone, then this basically makes bone a natural player in calcium homeostasis. So when we take a look at calcium, like if you have excess calcium, whenever you're laying down bony matrix, because calcium is part of hydroxyapatite, Osteoblasts, when they're depositing bone, will basically take calcium and embed it into the bony matrix. So essentially what's happening is you're investing, if you will, or embedding calcium in your bony matrix. So it's kind of like a banking system. You're banking that calcium into your bony matrix. Now, when osteoclasts tear your bone apart, they liberate that calcium and then they dump it into your bloodstream. And that's called uh, reabsorption. So deposition versus reabsorption. 
you know, the two terms for that. You either deposit calcium in your bones or you reabsorb it into your body, right? Or into your bloodstream. Now, what does calcium do? Why is it such a big deal? Um, well, calcium does a lot more. It's a lot much more important than just forming the hard structure of your bones, right? Than forming the, cal the hydroxy appetite. Calcium is actually necessary for muscle contraction. This is the signal. Muscle contraction. So skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and also to stimulate exocytosis. And we'll take a look at that actually in, in neurons, right? So the release of neurotransmitters. So calcium does all. So if you can't move your skeletal muscles, okay, that's great. That'd be a bit of a bummer, wouldn't it? You wouldn't be able to move, but you'd be alive. Um, if you can't contract your cardiac muscle, you're screwed. There's no way out of that one. You're dead, right? Um, and if you can't send a, 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 neuro, a neurotransmitter, then your nervous system is functionally dead, right? So two of these three are life and death situations. So one of the reasons why your bones are basically an important reservoir of calcium. So it's not just about hydroxyapatite. Calcium actually has much more importance to it than that. So let's take a look at some of these mechanisms, right? We said we have to deflect the peak and we have to inflect the trough. So how do we do that? Let's start off with our hormones that regulate calcium homeostasis. We have two of them, parathyroid hormone, which is produced by the parathyroid gland. Calcitriol, talked about that one, haven't we? Sort of. This is your vitamin D. This is your active version of vitamin D produced by the kidneys. But what this does is it basically stimulates absorption of calcium. And so this is a reason why vitamin D is always important to get a hold of because it's part of your calcium homeostasis system. And then of course, calcitonin is the partner to the thyroid hormone and it has basically an antagonistic effect to the thyroid hormone. First of all, parathyroid hormone um, is essentially going to be the hormone that responds to a reduction in blood calcium. So when you take a look at calcium homeostasis, parathyroid hormone is responding to the trough. This is the one where it inflects the curve to make it go back up. Well, how does it do that? Well, let's take a look at this for a second. First of all, what it does, it activates the osteoclast. What do osteoclasts do? It breaks it down and then it releases it into the blood, right? Thereby increasing calcium in the blood. It also increases the number of osteoclasts as well. That's one way that it releases cal calcium and increases the blood calcium so it goes up now. The other thing it does is it basically stimulates the absorption of calcium from the urine. So it basically tells the kidneys to hang on to your calcium that you've got so that you're not losing any calcium, right? You don't wanna be basically literally peeing away calcium if you need that. And PTH can tell the kidneys, you know what? We're a little low on calcium right now. So why don't you guys hang on to the calcium and bring it back into the bloodstream? And the kidneys can do that. It also will stimulate calcitriol production from the kidneys as well. And that will help 
you absorb more calcium in your intestines. So the calcium that you're eating and consuming, you do a better job of breaking it. So, um, I'm gonna try to figure out how much of wrinkle I wanna talk about, but anyway. So there's a regulatory molecule that um, osteoclasts and osteoblasts express. So this is basically when it expresses, it means it's on their surface. It's called rankle. And it stands for receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa beta. So in it ligand is the LP, so rankle. Um, and so you have two different forms of this particular regulatory molecule. It's either bound in a membrane or it's free floating and soluble um, around there. And so um, this has the capacity to um, increase inflammation. Um, and so it kind of upregulates the inflammatory response through cytokine activity. And we actually came into uh, understanding what that means this actually because of COVID, right? Because a lot of times when we take a look at patients who would go through these cytokine storms, uh, um, a lot of times it was the cytokine storm that killed them, not the actual virus. The actual virus itself didn't do that much to the patient, but it was the body's reaction to the virus that created the cytokine storm, this massive systemic inflammation that pretty much destroyed, could pretty much killed a lot of people early on in uh, the COVID trajectory. So, so soluble rankle is a signal that will actually increase osteoclastic function. So you can actually use this to break down and stimulate the um, osteoclastic activity, breaking down more bone. Um, now, how do you basically manage this rankle thing? Well, you, you manage it um, with a type of uh, receptor called a tall like receptor and, and there's no reason why you should know what that means it's just a type of receptor that's designed to specifically go after rankle and it kind of allows you to be able to regulate the production the function of rankle that's kind of keeping rankle under control so that it doesn't just spin wildly out of control and creating these big cytokine and front inflammation storms right because that's important that's an important thing about all inflammation you want the inflammation to set in early on but you want it to die you want to dial it back right so your immune system is very good about dialing it back and not letting it get out of control it's like a controlled burn inflammation is very much like a controlled burn right you want to you want to let it loose so they can do its job but you want to be able to keep it under control and turn it off so that you don't burn down the entire city of chicago right so i'm just thinking miss o'leary's cow right that, that wasn't a controlled burn but there have been controlled burns that actually, even in Colorado within the last couple of years, that have turned into massive forest fires because the controlled burn got out of control and then it just took off. So ultimately then what's gonna happen is rankle will bind to its suppressor and then um, it'll be able to activate these osteoclasts. And the nice thing about these molecules is, and I don't want you to get hung up on receptorology too badly. I just trying to show you that there's a lot of nuances and complexity to the story of how you control these sorts of things even when it seems straightforward there's a lot going on that we don't mention that we would get much deeper into if we were a physiology class okay. but basically what this means is you have these different receptors that can control rankle rankle that can control osteoclast so you can use this rankle with this receptor to control osteoclast you can use different receptors to control rankle to have different effects on the osteoclast. Um, and then ultimately, your parathyroid hormone can also increase the production of rankle. So notice what's happening here. The reason why PTH is part of this game is because rankle is increasing in a couple of different ways, osteoclastic activity. And what does PTH want to do? increase osteoclastic activity so you can release calcium into the bloodstream. So basically the way that PTH 
uh, stimulates osteoclastic activity is through this rankle pathway. Okay. Now your heads are hurting. <clears throat> and by the way, that's obviously if you're thinking about, oh my gosh, this is going to be on the exam. This is an example of something, perfect example of something that is not necessarily high priority for like an exam question, but it's contextual to kind of give you a sense of fullness and background for like, okay, we just talked about PTH, but PTH doesn't do this just magically, right? It actually operates through other biochemical pathways, like through rankle and other receptors and different types of things that are all interacting, collaborating with each other that get it gets this ultimate this ultimate effect, which is the increase in osteoclastic activity, which is what we're going for. Okay? So that's just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how physiology works. Right? You have a lot of collaboration going on between these molecules. Okay. Of course, then we have calcitriol, which is basically it stimulates your intestinal absorption, right? which is your final terminal form of vitamin D. So you're not interested in the D that your skin makes or necessarily that your liver makes. You're interested in what your kidney makes, which is calcitriol. So this is the one that you want. This is the one that allows you to be able to absorb calcium in your intestine when you're ingesting it. And then of course, calcitonin is the flip side of that. Calcitonin will basically do the opposite of PTH. So PTH is acting at the trough to increase blood calcium levels, then calcitonin is acting at the peaks to deflect the calcium levels. So this happens basically um, when the calcium levels are high and what it does is inhibits osteoclastic activity. So it reduces high blood calcium levels. That's what this does, right? That's the other side of this homeostatic table tennis thing. And so this is kind of like a, a, ver a version, like a pictorial version of, of what you got here. So here's your homeostatic curve, your blood calcium levels. So if you disturb homeostasis, for instance, if you have high calcium levels, then what's going to happen is you've got receptors that will sense that. And then your C cells and your thyroid, which will make the calcitonin, that's what they do. Um, then what they'll do is they make the calcitonin and then eventually that'll break, that'll pack more bone into, uh, deposit more of that calcium into the bones. So the actual calcium will go into the bones and then I'll bring your blood calcium levels back down. And so that'll bring you into a deflection of the curve itself. Now, if you happen to be deflecting and now you want to turn this back up, then the opposite is true. During low calcium stress levels, you're going to make your parathyroid hormone, which is going to go through that whole rankle system to activate osteoclasts and things like that. That's going to break down osteoclasts and that's going to liberate more bone from or more calcium from the bone. And it's going to add that to your blood, which is going to increase your blood calcium level. So it's going to inflect at that point. Your calcitriol, which is being stimulated to be made in more amounts by your kidneys, is then going to be adding new calcium through your intestinal absorption when you're eating it. And your kidneys are going to retain calcium. So PTH will tell your kidneys, hang on to your calcium retain it, put it back in the blood. They'll be breaking calcium down from the bone and they'll be adding new calcium to the bloodstream. And then they'll be stimulating the kidneys to make calcitriol, which will then allow you to be able to more better and more efficiently absorb calcium. So to absorb more calcium, you've got like a three, you got, you're attacking it on three fronts. Taking it back out of your bones, absorbing what you're eating, and then retaining what you've already got. Right, making sure that you're not just frittering away in your urine, right? Because you got to take that back in. Now, generally speaking, whenever you're looking at a a a physiological homeostatic curve, oftentimes we usually spend more of our existence in one state than another. 
right? So most of the time, physiologically, we're in a state of deficiency or relative deficiency. So we see a bit of a stronger PTH response than we see for a calcium response. Why? Because we don't really eat a lot of calcium unless you're taking calcium supplements, right? But I mean, in our food in general, there's, we're not like flooded with massive excess quantities of calcium. So, but we can get quite deficient in calcium if we don't eat enough calcium. So oftentimes we tend to sort of hover around the troughs in homeostatic cycles because we're always in usually varying states of deficiency. And so we're kind of increasing our calcium blood levels to make sure that we have enough calcium to do what we need to do. Of course, that's a little easier for us, right? Because milk drinkers are getting calcium, so there's that. Supplement takers will get calcium from that. So it's a little bit easier for the calcium thing to get a hold of. But there's other metabolites where we generally run at more of a deficiency side. So you tend to see a dominant response. So like either a very strong trough response or very strong peak response, depending on physiologically where we tend to sort of hang out. Okay. But generally speaking, states of deficiency, relative deficiency. Okay, osteoporosis, we've already talked about, right? So we don't need to beat that dead horse. Um, this is basically just where your osteoplastic activity is outstripping osteoplastic activity. And you're laying down less bone than you're tearing up. And so that's going to be a, a kind of a Swiss cheesing, if you will, of your bone, right? Your compact bone. So it's just becoming a little more porous. That's because you're basically clearing that area out of bone, but you're not replacing it. So it's kind of like a little Swiss cheesy. You ever seen an osteoporotic bone? It looks like public bone, right? It's like got like little holes in it where you would normally see compact bone, right? So where it'd be more filled in. So you see like little holes. That's because those osteoclasts have stripped it out. They're doing their job, but the osteoblasts have kind of slowed down a little bit. And they're not quite as stimulated to lay that down in there. And we've already talked a little bit about before how it's a more common in women because of the menopausal thing, right? Because estrogen um, maintains bone density in women. And so when that stops being produced by the ovaries, then that starts to languish and the bone doesn't, and then osteoblasts aren't supported by the estrogen signal anymore. And so they kind of start to lose ground on the osteoclast. That's one of the reasons why we see it more in women than in men, but we see it in men as well. Um, it's just it's just done not to the same degree. Um, it's just a little bit different. But that's just because of the hormone. Because remember, both hormones are, are into bodybuilding. That's what they do for a living. They build your body. Um, and so that's uh, so if they if you're losing then you're going to start having some body material deterioration associated with osteoporosis is a perfect example. And so this is the reason why as you kind of get into postmenopausal states, oftentimes you, you will make a habit of having routine densitometries to sort of measure your bone density to make sure that your bones aren't becoming osteoporotic and things like that. <clears throat> So, what's the hope? First of all, there are some things you can do, right? So, this is kind of a list of different medications that that maintenance signal that estrogen does for the osteoblasts to sort of replace that piece of it. Some antibiotics actually have an effect. I'm not sure that's exactly. Um, and now it's calcitonin replacement, right? So this is one where this is a pro-deposition. This is where you have your pro-deposition. So you add uh, calcitonin replacement and stimulate and things like that. So you try to do everything you can to take things that will stimulate the, the new men lay down of a bony matrix and that and that'll help kind of slow everything down it doesn't necessarily make it go away but it can actually be quite effective in, in, in certain individuals of course every individual is different um, a little bit different in how they respond to things and that sort of thing but uh, these are the sorts of things that you can expect to, to take a look at uh, in terms of helping with that. And this is that 
ever ubiquitous image of just showing, you know, osteoporosis is kind of how these different things we think about is only one system affecting it. It's actually affecting multiple systems, right? So you can get into the endocrine system with calcitonin being produced off of the thyroid gland and the nervous system, right? We have pain associated uh, with the osteoporosis because you're going to be more susceptible to fracture with osteoporosis. Um, obviously, all of your structural, like muscular integrity, those sorts of things. So it's kind of just shows you how all these different systems kind of work together. So the big, the big story of anatomy and physiology is even though we go after you like one chapter and one system at a time, that kind of delineation, that kind of categorizing effect, that boxing effect is a myth. Because your anatomy and physiology is actually all integrated and all blurred together. So especially in physiology, the more physiological you get, it starts to become difficult to know when you left the cardiovascular system and when you're into the urinary system because it just kind of all blends together. Of course, aging, we just talked about aging, right? Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> so osteoporosis is enough. Okay, so. Got a couple of minutes left. That's brutal. Even if not feeling yet, brutal. Okay. Um, so this chapter is going to go quickly, and it's intentionally to go quickly because where we want to go next is the muscle physiology chapter. That's the one we want to get to. So I don't want to spend a lot of time in this one because I'm not an orthopedist. I didn't play one on TV. I've never dreamed of being one. I appreciate them when I need them to set my bones. Um, but other than that, I'm good with that. So, but help, but this is helpful, right? Because we're bringing now, we're going from the skeletal system to the muscular system. And so once you get your frame down, now you want to start learning how to actually wire some musculature onto those frames, right? Of course, when you're talking about musculature and you're talking about joining your skeleton together we talked about bones in isolation but now you have to talk about articulation so how do you put these things together we know that you don't just walk on your femur we know that your tibia is involved in there too right and your fibula to a lesser extent but we know there's other bones that are taking just as much punishment as your femur so how are we putting all this together and that's the story of this particular chapter and it goes fairly quickly because I only want to talk about it for so long. I get, I get honestly, I get bored. But anyway, um, so let's take a look at how we can classify so joints. So we can basically take a look at joints in a couple of different ways. First of all, we can either classify them either structurally as either fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial. And those are three big types of, of um, classifications, or we can want to do it functionally, we can uh, determine on how they move, their degree of motion. We can either do that as synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, or diarthrotic. So these are basically two different classification systems. There's not a better way than another. It's just a different view of things. It's like what you're looking at, what you're focusing on, right? So that's basically what you're looking at. So let's take a look at fiber joints. Fibrous joints are basically so-called because they have tough fibrous connective tissue. So called fibrous. What does that mean? That means they're very collagenous, right? Heavy duty stuff, very structural. That's what they do. So they don't have any cavities. But these are non-movable. You don't do this so that you can move. This is structural. You do this for structure, stability, static, right? You want to keep something fibrous joint for. So some some types of fibrous joints we actually have are sutures, like your skull sutures are a type of fibrous joint. Syndesmoses, we'll talk about those. And gomposes, which actually I have one gomposes. That's your um, your periodontal ligaments that are connecting your teeth to your maxilla. So sutures basically are essentially 
a joint where you lay down fibrous connective tissue between them and you seal these two bones up. Notice you're not moving these things. These are structural. You're there, they're in place for structure purposes, right? You're not moving your skull joints. An extreme version of a suture is what's called a synostosis. Basically, it's a line. And most of them you can't even see. It's so sutured together, so cleanly put together that you almost literally can't see it. There's actually like a little synostosis right here between, just because as your, two, your frontal bone comes together, there's two bones. And when it sutures here in the middle, it gets so sutured so tightly that it's literally, it's like, it, you almost literally can't see it. So that's like a synostosis. And then of course the fontanelles we talked about before, right? Where we have basically the growth of the little uh, skull bones as they kind of fill in that space. And then they suture themselves up with these fibers, this fibrous connective tissue. And they basically create this immovable joint, this fibrous sutural joint. Second type of fibrous joint is a syndesmosis. So a syndesmosis is basically something that's connected together with some sort of like connective tissue. Um, so generally speaking, they're fairly immovable, but it's like a wrapping, if you will, of two joints together. Like the radius of the ulna is perfect, right? Because you have an interosseous membrane that holds your radius and your ulna together so that they're kind of like a package deal, right? So that would be a type of joint, a Um And so this is a, kind of like oftentimes referred to, they're so sutured together. That, I mean, they're so kind of wrapped together that they're kind of creating a single, a single situation. And the last one is gomphosis is basically your periodontal ligaments, which basically tether your tooth roots into the maxilla or the mandible. So if you're extracting a tooth, you're having to pull these apart. And you can just imagine that ripping sound. As we, yeah, so as they kind of come out. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why I asked the dentist to do, do whatever you want, just don't pull it out. Because I don't want to hear that sound ringing in my head. Because there's nothing you can do to make that sound go away. All right, so that's basically what's happening um, with the gomphosis. So cartilaginous joints that have two different types. They have a thin chondrosis, not a syndesis mosis, but an osymphysis. Um, so what we'll do is we will start with that one um, next. So you saw it. I wrote start, so it doesn't say. Anything. 